Lights, camera, action. In a studio where local filmmakers talk to other filmmakers about the inside world of film. Cut! That's not the script. F*** it. We'll fix it in post. Do you wonder how films are produced and what really goes on behind the scenes? Well, stand by. Filmmakers Kevin Mumphrey, Victoria V.A. Jones, and Carson Hype Ferguson explain all the details. Right here on F*** It, we will fix it in post podcast. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Whenever you're listening, I thank you for doing so. I am, once again, Kevin Mumphrey, and this is F*** It. We'll fix it in post. Today, we have an actress who's actually been in the industry for 20 years now. And this is our first guest from overseas. She's from Belgrade, Serbia. And we're talking to Mercedes De La Cruz. How are you doing today? Hi, Kevin. Really good. Uh, quick note. I'm yeah. actually from Canada, but I'm right living here. in Belgrade, Serbia right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. From Canada, but in Serbia. So okay. you're um, beginning your start of the arts began with dance what is, mm -hmm. what is it did you remember about dance that just attracted you ah <sighs> well you know i've always really liked moving and grooving <laughs> you know um but i don't know if it was necessarily the dance that attracted me uh was more so the performing so i i have these like really fond memories of being on stage. And I, I think the first year I started dancing, I was three. And at the end of the season, you have um, the recital. And it was exactly this dance school that I was with was quite large. And the recital was big, like it, you know, it wasn't held in a school gymnasium, it was, you know, in a big theater. And I just remember being on stage. And, you know, like, I couldn't see the audience, it was all dark, and the lights are down on you. And like that feeling of, I don't know, anticipation and the crowd and uh, yeah, singing and dancing and being out there and feeling all that energy. That's what I really was striving for, I guess. That's what I, I, I longed for. And even at the age of three, like I loved it. So it, was, <laughs> it wasn't even the dancing really, it was the performing, which of course is quite fitting since I'm a performer. <laughs> so when you um back when you were three there was no nervousness at all no <laughs> not at all i was always like my mom said actually even with that first performance um i was the loudest the one with the biggest smile the the one that you know was just beaming like i guess she said afterwards the parents would come up and be like was that your daughter oh my gosh she's <laughs> so good and like good like what are you doing at three that's good but it, it wasn't really that it was that i just didn't care you know i was just full of of energy and self-expression and um unapologetically me <laughs> so, so i'm guessing you actually you went from dance to theater yeah well in in my dance school um I started out with ballet and, you know, um, from ballet, I, I went into jazz and then we had something called song and dance, which is actually musical theater. So probably by the age of like six, I was probably doing the musical theater. Um, and then outside of my dance school, I also took musical theater. And then it wasn't until I was probably, geesh, in my Oh, well, no, when I was 13, I did my first theater, but it, it was a while after that until I actually like transitioned into um, film and TV acting. So how does, um, I tend to like the actors with actors, theater, because a lot of theater actors transitions to film and television really well. So what is it about mm. theater that makes it so seamless of a transition? Um, well, you know, I don't know if it's seamless <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> for me, it wasn't. Um, it was the next progression at, for sure. But because I grew up on the stage and, and even with dancing, it was all about big smiles. It was all about showing the audience at the very, very back what I'm feeling. So it was, it was larger than life. And on TV, you can't be like that. 
if you show the audience what you're thinking, if you act sad or you act happy, um, it's considered bad acting. So it's not necessarily seamless. However, in uh, theater, you learn a lot of the basics, right? You learn um, how to move with the scene. You, you learn, let's say, breathing exercises and other things to help you get into the body and whatnot. So, I mean, it's a progression, absolutely. But for me, I don't think it was seamless. It was definitely something that I really had to focus on um, was not being so big, right? Was not being so telly, basically not showing, not doing anything. I had to stop doing <laughs> and start feeling so it wouldn't look like I was doing too much, if that makes sense. So like with television, I guess you have to be more subtle. Yeah, like you really can't do anything and you can't move too much either. Like if, you, if you're doing a close up, and, you know, the, the camera's just on you and you even move your head, you know, quickly in, 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 a, in a direction. It's like it's too much for that for the audience. It's too much for that specific uh, camera angle. So you, you have to just like be still, basically. And because the camera picks up everything, you just have to think something and then the camera will see it. Like it, the camera is your friend, but it can be your enemy if you're doing too much. <laughs> so um, as far as like blocking, would you say it's somewhat the same with stage and film? Um, well, you know what? So blocking, blocking, I'll just explain that for the audience in case they, they don't really know what that is. Um, you block a scene, let's say you've never um, played this scene before and you have the different, um, well, obviously people in the scene and they need to know where to move, but also the camera needs to know where you're going to be um, so that it can be in a perfect position to get your angle, to get other people's, whatever. In blocking, if, if you have a mark down there and you don't hit that mark perfectly, then the camera's not gonna get you or you're gonna be in front of somebody else's shot or something like that. So that's really different. If you're um, rehearsing a scene and you're doing, I guess, a blocking, it's not really called that the same in theater. It's more of a rehearsal. You wanna get to those specific places, but it's not as finite you know, of a position. You're like, yeah, you're gonna be downstage or you're gonna be back here. And it's okay if you're off a little bit but in film and TV, you have to be on that mark. Otherwise, they may not find you in the camera. Or like I said, you might be blocking someone else. So like with stage, you can kind of be off a bit. Right. <laughs> it's perfection. Yes, exactly. Now, with, with theater, you are, you're the, um, that's what I'm thinking of, the response from the audience is immediate. Mm -hmm. so I, like, is it a bit like euphoric? They kind of just have the audience there. Uh, it's, it's for me. It was kind of what I lived for, right? Like, I'd be able to tell, like, you know, did that joke land, or do they like it, or whatever. And so, I mean, it can be like awesome, and it can also be detrimental <laughs> to your performance if <clears throat> if you feel like you know, you're not doing a great job and you feel like you're not connecting with the audience, you know, it might pull you out or it might help guide you. Um, with film and TV, you don't have that. But in film and TV and also in theater, I, I don't necessarily put it on the audience. I, it's more about how I am connecting with the other character in the scene. And that's kind of the gold for me. Um, if I'm doing a scene and I'm listening to my scene study partner or I'm listening to the person that I'm acting on that show with or that film with or whatever, and we're connected uh, and we're moving through the motions and it, it, it feels like there's flow and, you know, we're, we're both in it, you know, like that's sort of the gold. And then things just show up a little bit differently every time. Like, you know, they, they may do a facial expression that I wasn't, you know, expecting, or they may say something that we hadn't had planned. And then that turns my next line into something 
different and then you have gold you know like you just have to move and groove uh with the energy of the scene and that happens both in film and in tv so if if you're just looking for that then it doesn't matter if you're on stage or behind the camera you know it just feels good <laughs> now do you like when like you were mentioning where you're a scene partner it may have a different facial facial expression or say a line differently to where mm -hmm. you have to instantly kind of move with that it is mm -hmm. I'll take for somebody who's very structured doing something mm -hmm. that's even slightly off would throw them completely off. So is this something you, you kind of, if it throws you off or is it something you, it excites you a bit? Well, that's acting, right? Like yeah. uh, it, you don't want to go into a scene having it planned out how you're going to be. Because if let's say, I decided how I'm going to do a scene and the other person does it differently, but I still do the scene the way that I had intended, then it doesn't look good. It's not good acting, right? It, it's the disconnect. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Good acting is people responding to one another. And, you know, when I say they make a different facial expression, what I mean by that is there, there's a different feeling. There's a different, um, essence to what's going on and then you just have to go with that right and and in those instances like you're really connected and people say like you know oh they had good chemistry well to me I don't know if chemistry is really chemistry I think like that idea of this you know elusive this el el elusive chemistry it's actually more like am I listening and am I responding truthfully to what they're saying and are they listening and responding truthfully to what I'm saying? And if you do that, like, it doesn't matter who you're in a scene with. I don't believe that personally that chemistry is something that like either you have or you don't with a person. I think, <laughs> I think you could have it with anybody as long as you're really just in it, you know? That's an interesting perspective. I never really heard it like that. Mm -hmm. uh, one more thing uh, as far as theater, like when you would go out, do you, um, when you're like, do you look at like people in the crowd or do you like you have like a focal point that you're looking at? Like, how, how far is I, your eyes? How do you go about that on stage? Um, well, it depends on what you're playing, but typically you can't see the audience <laughs> because the lights are in your face. So it just looks like a blur. Um, and then also like the audience and this depends, like, again, what I was you know, going to tap into there was it depends on what kind of play that you're doing. If it's an interactive play with the audience, then of course you would maybe make a focal point or have somebody there that you know you're going to look at, or maybe you choose three people spread out if you can see the audience that is and use them um, as different eye lines. But typically the audience isn't there, right? You're not interacting with them. So if I were to be looking in the audience for something, then I'm not actually in the scene. And then I'm not able to have that magic with the person that I'm performing with, right? If I want to be in it, then I've got to be in it with them. And the audience is not there. All right. So at what point did you decide that you, kind of, you wanted to transition from stage to film? Um, you know, I think I always wanted to be an actress. Um, on film and I, you know I had these different ideas about it too like I thought oh I'm just gonna get and this is like you know what I thought when I was like a child I thought oh, okay I know what's gonna happen they're just gonna they're just gonna see me and then they're just gonna throw me in their movie and I'm gonna become a big star like <laughs> I thought it would like be so simple <laughs> yes 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 of course uh, and this was my big dream um, and it wasn't like that at all <laughs> You know, I, I wasn't scouted, wasn't recognized, you know, um, it took a lot of <laughs> blood, sweat and tears. Um, but I think um, I think once I realized to like, I always I, I stuck at, I, I, I stuck dancing out for a really long time. Um, I think because I thought my mom thought I was a really great little dancer and I thought she liked it, you know, like yeah. I think I would have gone into more theater and film and TV a lot sooner um, had I not been trying to please my mom. And my mom never said like, don't be an actress. Like it wasn't like that at all. It was just something I had in my mind. Like, oh, she thinks I'm a good little dancer. So I'm just going to keep doing that. 
you know, get approval. (laughs) Um, And then I think once I wasn't trying to get my mom's approval is sort of when I did the transition to like, oh, what do I really want? Um, And there was lots of movies. There was, you know, like when I saw Quentin Tarantino films um, at 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 quite a young age um, and I saw the different sort of ways that you could tell a story, I was like, ooh, this is interesting. You know, it, it wasn't just what I thought, you know, when I, when I started seeing different kinds of films. Um, so it, it got me excited. And then I think it wasn't until, gosh, my nearly, well, I was at a high school when I had done some music videos and um, commercials and things like that. And then I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. This is too cool. And when I got myself on my first TV set, I had I had moved from Edmonton to Vancouver, Canada. And Vancouver, Canada is considered to be Hollywood North. So it was like the place to be either than Toronto um, if you wanted to get into film and TV. And just prior to that, I was, I was sort of doing a bunch of stuff that I wasn't really inspired about like I had a home decor and painting company and I was doing marketing and promotions and I had a little um uh this promotion company that would go out and have models do events and fashion shows and things like that and you know I I enjoyed doing that and I enjoyed doing the choreography for a lot of that stuff but I still was like "Eh, this isn't really it for me you know I was traveling and modeling and doing some things, but I still really wanted to be in front of the camera. And it wasn't until I had this one friend of mine and I sat down and he had been taking my photos since I was 17 years old. His name's Robert Andrews. He's a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. I love him like a brother. Um, And he was like, gosh, you know, you just don't seem happy. And I wasn't, you know, like I had, Mm -hmm. I had a lot of success in my life. I, you know, I, I had all the designer handbags and, you know, like, all the stuff and a beautiful home. And I was like, I don't want to say miserable, but sort of, (laughs) I wasn't following my passion. And so we said, well, what is it that you could be doing every day that you would be excited to get up and do? And like, not even needing to think, I was like acting, hands down. I want to be acting. And he goes, okay, well, you got to move. So I did that move from Edmonton to, to Vancouver. And like, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any friends or family out there. Um, I didn't have an agent, you know, like (laughs) I didn't really know what I had in store, but I just fit whatever I could into my Volvo, gave all my stuff away, moved to um, Vancouver. And this is back at the time when like, you don't, you didn't really have computers at home. So you'd have to go to like internet cafes. (laughs) So I'd be at an internet cafe, you know, making up a resume and sending them to agents. And um, it was, it was cute. It was fun. It was lovely. And I was also petrified because I had no idea what I was doing and I got myself doing uh, background and I didn't even know that there was such a thing as background <laughs> but background performing is you know like you're not saying anything but you're in the scene and I got myself onto this tv set and it was like crazy magic to me you know it was also like groundhog day I felt like I was stoned or something you know you got to do these scenes over and over and over again and you have to like pretend to talk and then sometimes you are talking and you know then you have to do the scene all over again where you walk in and you pretend you're meeting your husband and you're talking but you're not talking and like it was just so weird to me and I was like yes like it was it was weird and it was awesome all at the same time so anyways I was hooked and I knew that I made the right decision for sure (laughs) now with me being American when we think of uh, like Hollywood North we didn't, I wouldn't have thought Vancouver. Mm. So like what, could you kind of like expand on the, the Hollywood scene in Vancouver? Cause I would have thought it was Toronto. Cause that's kind of the spot you hear about a lot here. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's what it's called. <laughs> Hollywood North. And they, you know, they, they have uh, such amazing production over there and the, the landscape and the city and all of that can be made to look like anywhere in the world. So, um, you know, lots of episodic TV shows from the U S are filmed there, right? Like all the Marvel TV shows, all of, 
uh, God, you know, I, I can't even begin to tell you um, all the different networks, but they, they like to go to, to Vancouver. I mean, they've got great talent. Um, the locations are incredible. The weather is great too, right? Like in Toronto, I mean, the winters are pretty brutal and you don't get that in Vancouver, right? I mean, yeah, we have winter, but if it snows, like it doesn't stick really. So you can film all year long there and um, they still do have the mountains. So if you want to do something like snowy or ski season or something like that, it's easy too. as soon as you go up from Vancouver to Whistler, which is like an hour and a half away, you have a winter wonderland yet you can go down to Vancouver and boom, you know, you can film outside even in December and it's not freezing, freezing. And they also have the ocean and they have the mountains. So you kind of get the best of all worlds in one place. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. Because <laughs> when I think of Canada, I think of cold and I don't do well with cold weather. So well, then Canada. don't go to Toronto in the winter. <laughs> they get so much snow and it's like, it's crazy. Yeah. But, but Vancouver is not too bad. I mean, it, it does get to be cold. Like I said, like it can snow, um, but it doesn't stay. And there's even times of the year where you can be up at the glacier and skiing and the same day you could be down at the ocean and, you know, be sun tanning on the beach. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Now, what kind of one do uh, you elaborate on when you move from Edmonton to Vancouver and you say like, you, you know, nobody and you tend to hear these mm -hmm. kind of stories a lot. Like you just hear they moved to, Los Angeles with a few hundred dollars in a dream. But yeah. you never really hear about how, how did they get from like, how did you get from going to this spot to kind of putting yourself out there? So how did you kind of, how did you kind of get yourself into these studios and putting your name out there? Um, well, you know what? It, it's people helping people a hundred percent. I mean, that that's always been that way for me then. And even when I moved to Serbia, but um you know, the first thing was when I was in um, Edmonton, I had done some acting classes and I'd met people who, you know, had either lived in Vancouver, or knew people that had or whatever. And they just, they're like, yeah, if you go down, you know, try this or try that. And there was actually uh, a dear friend of mine who I'd done an acting class with. And he had recommended, I said, well, if I go down to Vancouver, like, what am I going to do for work? And he's like, well, you know, you can work in a restaurant. And I was kind of overdoing that. And I'd done that for so many years. I managed bars and restaurants. And I didn't really want that lifestyle anymore. Um, but he'd recommended uh, this spokesmodeling company uh, they, where she does, like, marketing and promotions and stuff. And her name was Tracy Miles, who had this company. And he was like, yeah, you should talk to Tracy. And, you know, I had a marketing promotions company in Edmonton. So I was like, oh, yeah, perfect. I could totally do this. So I contacted her before I went down and she's like, yeah, come on down and I'll give you a job. And so I thought, okay, I got a job. Um, I, I had a, an awesome opportunity for this little hobbit hole of a place. Oh my gosh, this place was so tiny. I was used to having, I had 3000 square feet and multiple vehicles in Edmonton. And this place that I was going to live was, I think, like 350 square feet. <laughs> like It was a fraction oh. of the size of what I was used to having. And it was a basement suite. But the basement suite wasn't a legal suite. So the ceilings weren't actually even the proper height. Like, I'm 5'4". I'm super short, very tiny. And I could touch the ceiling with oh. the bottom palm of my hand not even like my fingertips on my tippy toes like I could touch it with the palm of my hand you was in so a box. um what's that you was in a box basically yeah basically it was so super tiny um and actually even my bed it wasn't on a proper mattress like you know in, in a bedroom there was a cutout in in the wall where it had a little cubby and in there was where the mattress could fit <laughs> slept in there it was crazy um did you yeah sleep? so yeah well you know what uh, it was actually like quite comfortable in many uh respects because it was you know sort of sort of like a cave <laughs> but um there was times like in the morning I'd forget where I was and I would go to sit up 
quickly in bed and I'd hit my, my head oh, on, on the, on the, on the roof area of it. And it sort of jut down and there was this uh, beam and I actually still have like an indent on my forehead from how many times I oh. smoked my head getting up in the morning and no word of a lie. I actually lived there with a boyfriend too. Like he, he was working um, was abroad. Yeah. Like we made it work. I mean, he was there every second week and um yeah, he well, I mean I lived down there for probably 6 months. I did end up moving upstairs when it became available, but I mean it was very different for me. I went from living in this gorgeous home with, you know, friends and family around and like I said vehicles and then I had no car and no friends and a teeny tiny hobbit hole <laughs> that I lived in and I was happy, happy, happy. I had all of this stuff in Edmonton and I thought oh this stuff will make me happy and it just obviously didn't it's not the things right it's your mental state and it was really super freeing to get rid of all that stuff I gave everything away and I was down to like next to nothing I felt really free and available to go and do and be and not have to worry or feel tied down by anything so, like, how long were you in Vancouver before you got, like, your first audition? Oh, boy. Um, my first audition was, I'm not really sure, actually. Uh, I did find an agent quite quickly. And from there, it was, ah, geez. I don't, I don't know how quickly the auditions came in. Like, I, I think it was right away, but they were really small, right? They were for really small things um, where I would go out and had, I would have one line or something. And I was scared. I was super freaked out. I didn't know really what I was doing. And I didn't know how to deliver even just the one line. And um, casting was, it was scary to go to castings. And, you know, just everything was, new right and I didn't really know anyone and this this whole thing about film and tv I felt was like you know so different and magical <laughs> I was just so happy to be there but I was like also like what am I doing here you know um and I think I think the first thing that I really got was probably like a commercial or something and I don't think I even said anything on the commercial so it was pretty easy, pretty easy to do. Uh, and actually, uh, I think the first commercial that I did was for Infinity, this Infinity car commercial. And I met this other actress named Bethany Brown, who I'm very close with to this day. Um, and it was it was neat. It was like our first meet. Um, and we both stuck out this industry um, this whole time. And we still see each other every so often um at auditions and you know you know doing different things and we've been a good support to one another and it's just like that right like well it's been that way for me is everyone I've met along the way has um either you know made an impression on me or given me um a little bit of love or a little bit of know-how or have point me in a direction that I've tried or you know have um given uh a look at you know, it, again, like I was saying, people helping people, that's sort of how it's been for me. I try to help as many people as I possibly can and people help me as much as they can. And it's a give and a take. Now, it, you, t you said you had your agent rather quickly and you never really hear about how someone gets an agent. So mm. how do you go about getting yourself an agent? Well, I, I had to get my, my resume out there. I had to make one, first of all, and I didn't have a lot to put on it. You know, I had some of my dancing and I had some of my um, theater and I had done up to that point, a, one movie, a bunch of music videos. Um, I had done some training videos for like for certain businesses. And these were all stuff that I had gotten when I was in, in, in Edmonton, um, so I had auditioned before, but it was just different because it was in a new city, right? So I didn't know anyone. Um, so I only had a few things on the resume. However, I definitely had, you know, passion, <laughs> charisma, and uh, persistence. 
So I, I found uh, the names of a bunch of agencies and I just blasted them all from the uh, internet cafe down the street, um, blasted them with my headshots and my resume. And I you know, would go in for interviews. And, you know, I mean, for, for me, I think, you know, I have a mixed race um, look and I am very mixed eth- ethnically. Um, so I think that was something that was a little bit of a help for me in the beginning as well, right? Like, you know, I, I can play a lot of different characters and we need that for storytelling. So I think, I think that was also a help um, in a sense, because I mean, I got lots of interviews like right away and I would just go in and they would, you know, give me something that they wanted me to put on tape or to perform for them. And I would do that. And I got a couple of offers and then I just went with who I felt the most connected to. Um, I don't still have that same agent. I've changed over the years, but um, for the last handful of years, I've been with Q agency and I really love them. Uh, the, the current um, representation that I have right now is Melise Kelly with Q agency and her and I are like sisters. <laughs> She's such a sweetheart and she, makes me feel like her number one client. I, I think she just does that with everybody. You know, she's just that kind of girl. And we really like support one another. And even me being out here in Serbia, um, she's been such a great support, even though I'm so far away. So yeah, I mean, having good representation is really important. Um, but I don't mean good. I mean, like a good um, connection with them, right? Because you have to work together. And uh, I've just been really lucky to have really good representation. Now, uh, like you said, these audition, like, so what was the uh, audition process like for you for going for these commercials and music videos? Uh, well, the, the music videos and things like that prior, I, I just sort of had an in, like I, I knew the director or I knew, um, the people that were putting it on and they just offered them to me. I've actually gotten lots of offers in my life. Um, And auditioning wise was very different in Edmonton than it was when I got to Vancouver. And it it was just, you know, there was just so many more people that you're up against in Vancouver. So yeah, you have more opportunities, but you also have um, more people that are fighting for it at the same time. So in Vancouver, what would typically happen is, you know, you get your agent will get a uh, breakdown sent out. And so it'll say like, okay, looking for mother, let's say 25 to 35, ethnically ambiguous or Hispanic or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, fun loving, blah, blah, blah. And the agent sees that and says, okay, who do I have on my roster that's like this? And then Melise would say like, oh, yeah this looks like Mercedes. Let's, let's put her up for it. So they send in your resume and your headshot. And it's almost like Tinder, basically, like the casting will look basically at the picture. And it's like, yay or nay, swipe left or right. (laughs) Right. And if they decide, yeah, you're a good look for what they're looking for, then they'll offer you an audition. And then your agent comes back to you and says, does this time and day work for you? yes or no and then if it's a yes okay then you prepare the sides so the sides are a portion of let's say the script or whatever it is that they want you to perform and you have maybe a day maybe two to get all of that down and have your character ready and da 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 and then you would go to casting and when you get there there would be usually there would be uh the casting director uh someone who is the reader that will read the other side of the scene to you um that you're playing against and then someone who's would hold the camera basically and do the lighting and then they would record that and that would be sort of the first round and casting would look at the tapes and decide okay out of everyone that we saw today who do we want to submit that makes us look good right like they're not going to submit something that isn't working um and they said submit that to the client and then the client will look at it and decide okay who do we really like who do we want to see again and then they may have a callback and so They'll decide, okay, yeah, we liked Mercedes, we liked Anne, we liked Jill, who knows, and then they have you back. And when they have you back in the room, they'll have those same people, the casting director, the reader, the person who's doing the camera, but now they'll have the client and the director. And so the director will give you a redirect. 
maybe how you did it isn't how they want it to be done, but they liked your look or they liked whatever you did. And let's try it again like this. Da, da, da. And so you go back and maybe now in the room, there's, I don't know, it could be a large callback where there's still 10 people or it could be, you know, three people. And then out of that, they'll maybe have another callback. Um, and, you know, whoever they end up going with is, is who, who gets the role. Um, but now it's really different. Now you don't go to casting agencies because of COVID. So um, you, the same procedure happens in the beginning with the breakdowns and, you know, the casting agents doing the Tinder swipe and deciding whether or not they want to see you. But now you do this all from home. So you have a friend or someone maybe that you live with, or maybe an acting coach, do the scene with you, you record it, you put it all together, edit it, you send it to your agent, your agent sends it to casting. And so you don't have to do any of that going, you know, being nervous in front of anybody, you know, like you're just doing it for yourself. So there's definitely some benefit. I, I'm able to and this is why I moved. Um, I'm able to do it from anywhere. So if I want to be on a trip in Mexico with my partner, I can do that. And if I get an audition, then I can just tape it there. And if I get the role, then I can just fly back, you know, like it's perfect for the lifestyle that I really wanted to have. And my partner and I always spent a lot of the year traveling. And I, I always had to put my acting career on hold when we did that, because, you know, if I was going to audition, I had to be home for a lot of it. Um, I know I'll get to a point, hope, hopefully at some time. And now it doesn't really even matter where, you know, I won't have to audition for all the roles and I could be anywhere anyway. But that wasn't my experience at the time. At the time, I had to get into the casting room. Um, but like I said, now that's all changing. And it's it's awesome. And it gave me the opportunity to move abroad. <laughs> now, do you think this, like, I, I don't want to say post-COVID, but the how they kind of audition now, do you think this is something that will kind of continue on? I think so. I mean, I, I hear my agent and other people say, oh, I'm looking forward to when those casting rooms open. I don't think they're going to personally. That's just, you know, my opinion. Um, I think this is a lot easier for a lot of people. I know it's a lot more work for my agent because obviously she has to do all these submissions and has to look through all these audition tapes and blah, blah, blah. And I think something has to change in that aspect where, um, somehow the agents get more compensation or like maybe from the union or I don't even know. I'm not sure how it looks, but they're definitely doing a lot more work. Um, I don't know if it's, I would assume it's less work for casting, obviously, because they don't have to have everybody come in. Um, but it's just so much better for the actor, right? Like it, I, I can do the tape 10 times if I want. I can change the lighting. I can decide that oh I don't like that I can look at it and be like you know what that's not working let's try something else you know it gives me an opportunity to 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 change things and redirect myself um and like I said the, the beauty of being able to do it from anywhere is fantastic and now with zoom oh my gosh this is incredible if I'm traveling and I want to have my uh acting coach help me with my self tape I just put them on and I use him as my reader and I could have him from anywhere in the world. And like, he's my favorite, right? Like I don't have to go to his house or, you know, worry about, I used to worry about too, how am I going to get someone to read this for me? Um, my partner doesn't love doing that. And sometimes I'm by myself, right? If I'm traveling, um, now I can just do it from anywhere with anyone at any time. It's, I think a godsend personally. <laughs> so have you done a self, self take through Zoom? Always. <laughs> yeah. Not oh. well, okay. When I when I say through Zoom, I don't record it on Zoom. I've done I've done callbacks with casting directors and directors um, through Zoom. But typically if I'm gonna have like I because I'm traveling so much between um, Europe and Canada, if I'm in Canada and I have an audition tape that I need to do and my acting coach is in Europe, then we just pick a time, we meet over Zoom. I put the I put his eye line up uh, by my camera, and I record it on my phone through my camera phone. But okay. I use him through Zoom um, to see him and hear him and be able to re react to him like as if he was in the room. I may have to use that that method. Yeah, I, I I don't have a lot of friends that like to be my readers, 
per se. Yeah. Like most of the ones I have, they've moved to New York or Atlanta. So, mm. so I just have to ignore people. I say, look, I don't need you to act. I just need you to talk it. I'll do the act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh, my gosh. Friends that just are trying too hard. It's really cute, but it totally does not help. <laughs> no, it throws me completely off. Yeah. I don't need definitely. you to scream at me. Just just say what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> so but for COVID, you're, I mean, how did you navigate like having your personal life, like when you see your family or taking vacations? So how would you go about like making time for yourself? And also for acting. I'm sorry. Did you say before COVID or yeah, after COVID? I didn't. I no, didn't. no, before COVID. I'm sorry. Because you said now it's a lot easier. You can travel. You can audition. You didn't have to fly back somewhere. So how were yeah. you navigating before? Uh, well, if I was going out of town, I would just sort of have to tell my agent, like, hey, I'm not available unless it can be a self-tape. You know, and I would have to sort of sacrifice um, my career for going and being on vacation, which I didn't love. It didn't feel great. Like I inside, I really wanted to focus on my career, but I also wanted the balance of, you know, being being out of town and being on the ocean and doing, you know, for, for me, um, my spiritual practice has always been something that's been really important to me. And I love to go to spiritual retreats and um, lots of different, uh, like, I guess, ceremonies and, um, I don't know, I guess I could just call them all retreats basically, but I, I would like to be learning and in that, um, in that space. And that, you know, was typically me being in Costa Rica or, you know, different places, uh, where these retreats were being put on. And again, I would have to like, again, the word sacrifice, I don't like to say, but it was true. Like, I'm like, okay, I guess I'm putting acting on hold right now to no, like, better myself. Or I guess I'm sorry. I was like putting a pause button on your career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I didn't love because there was always this fear of missing out on like my perfect role, you know, or missing out on, yeah, something that I could be really great in or that next great audition or, you know, and then I'd see something that like someone else I knew got and I was like, man, that was during that vacation. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have gone, you know, like silly stuff like that, which I know now, like I, I have to, have to, have to spend that important time on myself and my um, spiritual practice and on just my happiness. Um, and so I, I don't, even if I go away now, I try to remind myself like, hey, this is only going to make me a better actor because I'm going to get more centered with who I am and uh, and it's perfect and I'm not missing out on anything. And, you know, my perfect role it will be the perfect timing as well. And I don't have to worry about it. But now I have to I can worry even less <laughs> because I can still get that audition and be away. <laughs> and you can really you can kind of be in that vacation that you're in. You can kind of right. let that all go. Yeah, because I felt really guilty a lot of the time, too. You know, like, I, I always dreaded, even though my agent has always been really super good when it came to me taking time or me going away or whatever, um, I still dreaded the conversation. You know, like, hey, so going away again. <laughs> yeah. The disappointment in her voice, you know. Um, but now she just gets me, and I work really hard. Uh, I also get a lot of my own work. Like it's not my, just my agent who gets me these roles. Like I do a lot of self promotion and I, I do a lot of networking and I get myself like, gosh, it feels like m almost 50% of my work I'm doing myself. Like, Hey, I'm not taking away from Elise. She does a lot of work, but I do too. And uh, I kind of like it that way. Like I like, I like making those connections and finding stuff myself as well. Now, that's one aspect I think that a lot of people don't necessarily realize going in. Like when they get an agent, it's like, oh, cool. The agent gets can take care of that part for me and I can kind of not do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So how do you still go about self-promoting yourself? Uh, well, I think you're always promoting yourself no matter where you go with who you who you are, right? And I try to be... Well, I'm just, again, un unapologetically me. Uh, I love people. 
I love talking to people. I love learning about people. I love helping people. And I think the helping of people has really helped me a lot along the way. So if I'm working on a project, I'm, I'm, I'm helping as many people as I can on that set. Um, and then they want to work with me again, right? Or if I'm out and I meet people that are in the industry or want to be in the industry, I try to help them as much as possible. And again, it's people helping people. So it's always sort of been that way. And I like to connect people too. Like if somebody has a project and maybe I'm not even great for it, but I know someone else who might be, then I try to get them in on that. And um, I think, I don't know, I guess maybe you get what you give. <laughs> now with acting, there's a, it says one of the industries that you, you face a lot of rejection. So right. how do you kind of navigate through it? Um, well, you know, people say that a lot, like that it's a lot of rejection. And I guess you could look at it like a lot of rejection. And I, I try not to look at it like that. Like I, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of learning, you know? Um, I, I don't necessarily feel like if I don't get the role that it's a rejection, I feel like if I did a great job in that session or on that tape or whatever, and it felt like flow and it felt like ease and I was really in it, then that's a win for me, you know? Um, yeah, I still get disappointed. There's still lots of times where I'm like, yes, I'm so perfect for this. Oh my gosh. And I want to work with this director. Yeah, totally. And then I don't get the call and I'm like, okay, well that sort of sucks. But I, I know too that, every little step in the right direction of me doing good work is opening other doors, right? Like, so maybe they don't want me for that project, but they're like, hell yeah, that was a great tape. Let's see her again, you know? Um, and each time I do an audition or each time I go and sink my teeth into another project, I learn more about me and I learn more about what I need to work on. You know, like there was something last year that, or it was this year that I had a British accent for, and I was like, wow, that was really super fun. And also I'm rusty, <laughs> you know? And so it gave me like, you know, a, a focus of where I want to spend more time on and how I want to spend my time. Um, and it just makes you, cause it's, it's, it's all training, right? It just makes you a, a better actor when you're doing more auditions and expanding your scope. You know, there's, there's been also lots of, like, every time I, I even get to do a production or a show or whatever, um, it's learning again, right? Because I'm learning how to work with new people. I'm learning new dialogue. I'm learning uh, new things about myself. And so it's always just constantly expanding myself. So I, I guess in turn, all in all, I mean, I can't, I can't look at it like it's rejection. I can only look at it like it's all forward momentum to an end game, right? And that's what kind of keeps you going. <laughs> I kind of have that same perspective. I kind of learned it rather quickly because when I started, I used to take it really personal. And then right. there was one role that I, I was certain I was going to get. And then I realized mm -hmm. the woman they cast that would, would have been my uh, romantic interest was a lot more older than me. Yeah, so yeah, it yeah. It made sense. Right. So they, oh, okay. It, it wasn't me. Yeah. And that's the thing to remember, too, is like nine times out of 10, it has nothing to do with your ability or how well you did. It's like, OK, just like you said, like uh, you are maybe too young or too old. Like, actually, you could never be the mother of this child who's 19 and you look 25, <laughs> you know, like that's just not going to work. Or maybe you look like the director's ex-wife. You know, <laughs> could, could be that, right? Like you just, <laughs> there's all these other variables. Um, or maybe you and the lead have exactly the same color hair and the same look, and that's just not going to work for the audience, right? They want to have like a blonde best friend and a dark haired lead, right? And if they choose this lead, then they're going to have to choose someone that looks a little different. So it's just like, you, you, yeah, you just can't take it personally because not like, honestly, if you've made it past the the callback stage, let's say, um, or you're down to like their top picks and you don't ever really know that, which is too bad because it would be nice to know like, oh yeah, they did actually really like me, but they didn't choose me in the end. 
um, then you would realize that like, you know, if you've made it that far, like you're doing something right. It's just, it wasn't perfect at that time for that role with all the other aspects of the production. So yeah. now when it comes Can't to dialogue, <laughs> mm -hmm. when it comes to dialogue, I mean, some people are better at it than others. How do you go about memorizing your dialogue? I'm really good at it. I don't know how it happened because I wasn't in the beginning. Like I remember even having go one line. <laughs> go ahead What's that? Your go ahead and toot your own horn. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, what I'm saying is like, it wasn't always that way. Like I would have a hard time sometimes with one line and remembering it and then being all in my head. Like I would never say this. Why would I say it? And I would get all upset about the fact that I would never actually, these words would never come out of my mouth. And I'd have to realize like, it's not my mouth. You know, it's the mouth of somebody else. Um, there was a point where I started taking a lot more oil. Now that might sound funny, but I was doing um, intermittent fasting and I was on the bulletproof diet, which is basically like a modified Atkins diet or paleo diet, you could say. Uh, and I was eating a lot of fat. And during that time, I noticed that I had a lot easier of a time remembering my dialogue. So I don't know for sure if it was really that or if I was just working really hard at the time, but I would definitely recommend a lot more fats in your diet. Um, and also it's my prep work now. Like if I spend a lot of time um, figuring out who I am, why I'm saying what I'm saying, who I'm talking to, how I feel about them, then the words like just flow out because it's me actually saying those words rather than this like elusive character that I have no idea who it is that's talking, right? So my prep work really helps. And then I think it's like anything, the more you practice, the better you are. And I audition a lot. Um, and so I'm constantly trying to remember dialogue. <laughs> and uh, I also have a line reader. And it's just a little app on my phone that I can read the lines uh, into it. It records my voice. I will record every person who has any dialogue in it and then I can just mute my lines and then it just goes on repeat. So I can practice that way as if I am literally talking to someone, uh, even though it's just me talking to me, pretending to be a bunch of other characters. <laughs> that really helps. What, what is that line reader app again? Because I'm <laughs> that myself. Well, let's see. This one that I'm using right now is called Off Book. So it depends if you have an iPhone or uh, an Android, but I, if you just go on to, onto the app store, you can just look for script reader or line reader. And those are so helpful, especially like you said, like, you know, if you don't have people around that you can practice with, uh, you can just use that and you can practice with anybody anytime. And then I just like to like walk around downtown with my earbuds on, making it look like I'm talking on the phone. So it doesn't look like I'm crazy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm basically talking to myself. <laughs> And that's a good way to get um, out of people approaching you. Oh, absolutely. Another <laughs> good way is just like, you know, look down. <laughs> look down or look up like you really are on the phone. But yeah, you're just recording. No, doing your lines. Yeah. <laughs> so, like what genre of film that you feel like is most that you're most that you enjoy doing the most? Ah, that's tough. I, I like it all. Um, I would like to do more, um, I, I guess, it, I don't know, I want to say serious roles, and more dramatic sort of roles. I I do a lot right now of um, best friend roles. I, I play that really well. I'm, you know, I guess because I am a good friend, it's really easy to like to play a good friend, you know, <laughs> like I, I like... I, I like people and I'm constantly like smiling and laughing. And so it's really easy for me to play a best friend on a romantic comedy. Um, but I also have like a deep dark side. Um, when I say dark, like, you know, not too dark at the side, but you know, we all do. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to play definitely some, some more dramas. I've done some horrors that I, I really like as well, but I, I would just like to, to play something a little bit more um, raw. Um, yeah, more thoughtful, more thought provoking. Um, and maybe even more sinister. I sort of like that idea. So you I like guess. to be a villain? 
I'd like to. Yeah, I'd like to be a villain. Absolutely. I've gone out for a few um, villain-esque roles these days. Uh, and I really enjoyed doing those auditions. So I know I'd really like to sink my teeth, uh, maybe even literally, <laughs> into some of those roles. <laughs> uh, maybe a vampire role would fit for you. I, you know what? I've played a vampire before. And uh, in the movie, I was actually like a good vampire. Like I didn't eat people. I ate rabbits. Um, and I did a have to sink my vampire? teeth into this rabbit. <laughs> What's that? You were a vegan vampire? No, 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 not vegan. I just didn't <laughs> want to eat, hurt people. Oh. I, so I, I would eat animals instead of people. I'd get bled that way. But this, this one, oh my gosh, this scene, I had to, I had to bite into this dead rabbit and obviously it wasn't a real dead rabbit but you know it was a rabbit fur um and they had put you know gauze or whatever inside with fake blood but we had done this outside in the winter and we were filming in like a teepee and it was super cold like we're talking in like the minuses uh and because i was this vampire and don't feel warmth or cold <laughs> they had me in like really next to nothing like animal skin bare feet bare legs running around outside and I had to bite into this fake dead rabbit and it was actually kind of frozen inside <laughs> so I'm oh. trying to chew on it and have the blood drip down my face but it was like ice and I was already so cold <laughs> and I had to stand there half naked oh my gosh it was yeah, it was absolutely freezing. It was fun. It looked great on tape, but it was miserable to do. <laughs> now, before, before we wrap everything up, just want to ask, you've been doing this for 20 years now. Uh, basically, you have a long so. relationship with, with film industry. Like, what is it about mm -hmm. it that makes you still love it? I don't know how to answer that. It's more like this passion inside that I can't put out. You know, like I've tried to walk away from acting a number of times <laughs> and I just can't do it. Every time I do, I, I feel like something is missing from my being. So, yeah, I just keep I keep returning to it. It's also been a really healing experience for me. You know, we, we get to learn a lot about who we are, um, where our blocks are, where our fears are, you know, we, we, with the different breathing exercises and introspection and looking into, you know, character development and what drives them and from where. And every time I take on a role, I learn something new about myself, like it's addicting. Um, and then the thrill of doing it, the thrill of being on set or the thrill of being in front of an audience, like there's just nothing like it for me anyway. I mean, maybe somebody who does downhill racing or something, you know, gets it from that. But for me, it's doing the role, you know, um, even just working on something in, in class with like a, with a partner and really being in it and really being connected. I guess that there's the, con the, that connection that we yearn for as human beings, like, you know, I, I get to get that uh, even with strangers, you know, or scene study partners, right? Uh, and that's really beautiful. And then just creating something and then seeing the end product too. It's like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe I did that, right? Like, that's me, you know, like that's, yeah. And I guess too, going back to that love for performance, even at the age of three, like it just, yeah, it hasn't gone away. I, like I said, I can't, I can't put it out. <laughs> so I think as much as I well and I don't even know if I'd actually ever want to leave this career like somebody said to me the other day like what, what, what you know what do you want to do when you retire and I was like retire like you mean not act anymore <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that right like it's I yeah I love it so much that you know even now like I'm not a, in the position to be making tons and tons of money quite yet at it so it is one of those things that I would do for free. Like I, I am sometimes doing it for free <laughs> and, and I don't mind. Like I don't mind taking a pay cut at this, at this time and making more later. Or even if I only just continued to make the kind of money I do now, I would be fine. Like I just love it. So yeah, I guess that's Mercedes, a long winded answer. <laughs> Mercedes, thank you for uh, taking time out of your day to talk to us. Thank you. And I wish you a much prosper, prosperous future. I see that you have a few projects going on in the future. So, yeah. once again, I am Kevin Mumphrey with <laughs> We'll Fix It in Post. And that is a wrap.